If you've got a Bible, please open it to the book of Acts. And we have a fairly long passage we want to read from. So we're looking at Acts chapter 21, verse 40, through to Acts 22, verse 29. Uh, So follow along as I read this entire passage for us this morning. It says, And when he had given him permission... Paul, standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language, saying, Brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Cilicia, but brought up in the city education brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. I persecuted this way to the death, binding and delivering to prison both men and women, as the high priest and the whole council of elders can bear bear me witness. From them I received letters to the brothers, and I journeyed toward Damascus to take those also who were there and bring them in bonds to Jerusalem to be punished. As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but did not understand the voice of the one who was speaking to me. And I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go into Damascus, and there you'll be told all that is appointed for you to do. And since I could not see, because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me and came into Damascus. And one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, well spoken of by all Jews who lived there, came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour I received the sight and saw him. And he said, The God of our fathers appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the vo- a voice from his mouth. For you will be a witness for him to everyone of what you have seen and heard. And now why do you wait? Rise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and saw him saying to me, Make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another I imprisoned and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, Go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And as they were shouting and throwing up, off their cloaks and flinging dust into the air, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging to find out why they were shouting against him like this. But when they had stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, is it lawful for you to be, to, for you to flog a man who is a Roman citizen and uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said to him, What are you about to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. So the tribune came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, Yes. The tribune answered, I bought this citizenship for a large sum. Paul said, But I am a citizen by birth. So those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately, and the tribune also was afraid, for he realized that Paul was a Roman citizen and that he had been, and that he had bound him. That's the word of the Lord. Let us just pray to the Lord for his enabling now. 
our dear Lord and our God. Uh, Father, we are here to talk about Jesus. Uh, Lord, not just as a kind of historical figure that has no bearing on our life now, but yes, indeed, historical. But Lord, one who died and one who now lives. And Lord, it's Christ that we want lifted up. It's Christ that we want to draw all men to, for in him is life. And Lord, so I pray for your um, work of the Holy Spirit to be upon our hearts and upon our life now, to be, that we would be encouraged in Jesus and that we would realize that he is our all in all. And for those outside of Christ, draw them to Jesus now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, as I've been telling us over the last two weeks, Paul came to Jerusalem to try to uh, sort of build bridges between the Gentile church and the church at Jerusalem. And when he got there, James said to him that there are many people who are speaking against you. A lot of rumors had gone around to say that Paul was actually against the people, he was against the law of Moses, and he was against the temple. And in a bid to placate uh, their... um, their anger towards him as one who has denied Judaism, James gave him some words of wisdom and said, I want you to connect with these four men and take this Nazarite vow. And the idea was that Paul, when he was going into the temple, being, um, going through the purification process, that people would say to him, ah, oh, brother Paul, it's not like what people have been saying. You actually do uphold my people. You actually uphold the law and you uphold the temple. Now, we know that didn't happen, did it? No, they saw him, and the rumors and the gossip uh, got around, and they picked up stones ready to stone him and kill him. Uh, How very hard it is to try and build someone's trust when it's been undermined by gossip. And so, luckily, the fortress of Antonia, uh, which the Jews were not happy with, actually overlooked the temple area that they could not go into. And the soldiers see what's going on, quickly run down back into the court of the Gentiles and basically save Paul. And we remember last week that Paul is then being dragged up the steps of the uh, fortress when he opens his mouth and speaks to the tribune and says, could I actually speak to these people who are just about to stone me and are trying to rip me out of your hands? And look at verse 40, because he says, and when, or it says, and when he had given him permission, tribune giving Paul permission, Paul standing on the steps, motioned with his hand to the people. And when there was a great hush, I mean, just picture this, thousands of people, great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language saying, brothers and fathers, hear the defense that I now make before you. And when they had heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even more quiet. And the question is, you've got an opportunity. What would you say if you were Paul? What would be your defense? What do you think Paul's going to say? I mean, this is a Hebrew man. His Hebrew is impeccable. Uh, He is perhaps one of the most learned, one of the most wisest men ever to live. He could have tied them in knots with his intellectualism of his knowledge of the Hebrew scriptures. But instead of providing with, to them an intellectual argument of why the Christian faith is the true and ultimate faith, that the gospel is true, in a kind of childlike manner, he just simply outlaid to them his experience of Jesus upon his life. He just gave them his testimony, a personal testimony of a humble, zealous Christian who was once an opponent of the gospel, but has been convinced of its truth and converted by its power is usually one of the most convincing evidences that someone has turned their back on this world and come to the reality of their knowledge of Jesus Christ a personal testimony of God's Christ's work on your heart. Why are testimonies of salvation so powerful? Because it's not theory. This is 
actual personal proof of the truth and power of the gospel to save someone. We quite often forget. Upon coming to Christ, I have heard so many testimonies. I'm sure you've heard testimonies. You love to hear them. To hear about someone who is going opposite to Christ. In fact, denying him, not even caring about him, turns their back on all of that and starts living for the Lord Jesus. It is a powerful word, isn't it? And so I think Luke here understands the power of a testimony because do you know how many times in Acts this testimony is written? Can anyone know? (laughs) Audience interaction? Three times. Actually, we've read it once. This is another time, and he will bring it up again. Three times that he gives this dramatic testimony. And the question is, why should a man so zealous for the law change from a persecutor of the way, that's what he called it, to a follower and defender of it? More than this, why should he do it if he knew that it would that he would suffer persecution, that he would receive no earthly honor, that he would have no ease, no rest, no riches. In fact, he would spend the rest of his life promoting Christ and suffering for it. Why should he do this? What made him do this? Because he came to realize that Christianity is not just simply a path to be walked down. It's not just be a religion to have alongside other religions. Christianity, what he realized, is it's about Christ. A man who lived, died, rose again, and now lives forever. It's about a man, Jesus, who is now Lord and Savior over all of the earth. I remember the time I came to Christ, that born-again experience of seeing Jesus with unclouded faith. I mean, what an absolute miracle it was. And maybe you've grown up in a Christian home and you say, I've not experienced that. I mean, I've not had any dramatic testimony. I've not (laughs) been outwardly rebellious. I've not done drugs. I've not done alcohol. Excessively, no hostility towards Christ. You've grown up in a Christian home and perhaps from the earliest age, you can remember that you've always followed Jesus. And yet you know though, by experience and by the word of God, that your standing before him can only be on the basis of Christ because you know your heart. And you know that it's wicked and it needs a savior. You know your unrighteousness and you need an outside righteousness to make you righteous. Let me, let me remind you, it takes the same mighty power of God to save an outwardly good person as it does to save an outwardly evil person. And an outwardly good person needs salvation every bit as much as a notorious sinner does. This morning, we will look at Paul's defense to understand the nature of conversion and the peril of rejection. And Paul's defense shows us that a person's salvation experience is one of the most convincing evidences of the reality of Christ. And I want you to cherish it and value it, and share it. So let us look at our first division, that is defense. Defense. As we look at this, we need to understand what is at stake. It's not ultimately about Paul's experience. It's not ultimately about his viewpoint over and against someone else's viewpoint. It is all about establishing the truth, this is what he's doing, that Jesus is the Messiah and is alive and is the guiding Lord over Paul's life and our lives as well. That's the whole point of this. So the first thing I want you to notice under defense is his confession. Confession. So remember the charge that the um, 
the, the Jewish believers, non-believers, um, gave him, that he was against the people of God, the Jews. He was against the law of Moses and he was against the temple. And he begins to show how closely aligned or how uh, much he values his Judaism and how closely aligned he was to it. He was brought up as a Jew. Uh, he was brought up more, you know, in, in one sense, he was a more prestigious and pious Jew than all of those probably who were listening to him that day. He came from a strict Jewish family. In fact, he taught at the feet, or he was taught at the feet of Gamaliel, it says, according to the strict manner of the law. He talks about his zeal of Moses in here. He talks about his zeal for the law. He even says that I was so zealous that I persecuted, verse 4, this way to the death. And he refers, we know a little bit later, uh, his reference to Stephen, that he was there when Stephen died, verse 7, or Acts 7. He even received letters from the high priest that he might go to Damascus to bind and deliver believers in Christ and bring them back to Jerusalem to try them for heresy. And he says, I was just as zealous for God as you guys are in trying to kill me right now. Why does Paul establish these credentials here? To show if you want Jewishness, I've got it. I've got it all over you guys. He is doing this, and take this in, he is establishing the fact that you can be zealous for God and still be lost. You can have all the pretense of a follower of God and still be lost and not know it. Let's just delve a little bit deeper into this thought because it's very important. If you've got a Bible, trust you have, turn to Philippians, Philippians chapter 3. We're here some time ago. Turn Philippians chapter 3 verse 4. Paul is basically there giving his credentials as a Jew. And he says this in verses 4 to 6. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Before Paul came to Christ. He served God with immense zeal. And notice what he says at the end of verse 6. He actually thought he was blameless for it. It doesn't mean that he was not guilty. We know that everyone is guilty before God. Everyone has sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And in one sense, we all know that. But in his understanding, he is saying, I had no sense, true sense of my guilt. I thought I was good with God. The only way this can occur, and it did so in the Jews' thinking and teaching, was that they underestimated God's demands and overestimated their own abilities. The only way you can do that, you've got to bring God down and you've got to rise you up. And so Paul is saying, if I could get to heaven by my righteousness, I had it. I was absolutely blameless but we know he wasn't and we know he was blind. So what would turn Paul around? What would turn Paul around from thinking, I've got this. I'm a worshiper of God. I'm a friend of God. What would do it? What would take him off the path of believing that he could get to heaven in his own good works? I mean, this is the real problem, isn't it? A number of weeks ago, I was with the AV guys and we're out the back and we're just talking about our pre-converted life. And Matt, you remember, we were sort of saying that I didn't realize I was so bad. (laughs) I didn't realize sin was so great. Like I, yeah, I thought things were a bit off, but I didn't see it so bad. I didn't know. I thought I was okay. I didn't see the wickedness of this world. I thought I was in one sense acceptable. And maybe that's where you are. Maybe you think, I'm okay in this life. I'm all right. I'm not that bad. That's Paul. Okay? So he's basically saying, guys, thousands right there. You think you're going to get to heaven? 
I thought I was too, and I was absolutely blameless. Something dramatically happened to him that totally switched that right around. Keep looking, that we're going to get to the conversion here. Conversion. So I was zealously righteous, yet utterly lost. Confession. Conversion. Let's read verse 6 back in Acts. And it says, As I was on my way and drew near to Damascus, about noon a great light from heaven suddenly shone around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And I answered, Who are you, Lord? And he said to me, I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting. Something dramatic changed that day that totally flipped Paul around. Do you catch it here? It's very simple. He came face to face with a living Christ. That was what turned him around. I was blameless until I saw Jesus, until he revealed himself to me. That is really what a powerful testimony is. It is saying, I thought I was on the right track. I thought I was okay. But now I stand here. I was blind, man. I was groping my way from Jerusalem to Damascus until I came face to face with Christ. Remember Jesus said, um, healed the blind man and the, uh, the Jews were saying, what happened? What happened? He said, it's simple. I, my eyes, my, sorry, he opened my eyes. I was blind and now I see. That's it. And you say, what about then Christ did he see? So what flipped him to realize I'm a really bad guy and I need the Savior? What about it? What was it about Jesus did he see? Well, then it goes on and tells, Jesus tells him to go into the city and he'll meet a man called Ananias. Let's read verse 12. One Ananias, a devout man according to the law, well spoken of by all the Jews who live there. Now notice what he's doing. He's saying, this is a real Jew as well. You don't think I'm a Jew? This is a real Jew. And let's see what this Jew says. And he came to me and standing by me said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very hour, I received my sight and saw him. And he said, the God of our fathers appointed you. Now, let me just stop there for one minute to digress one second. Whether your testimony is dramatic or not, whether you sought Christ or Christ jumped into your path like Paul, whichever it is, salvation is initiated by God. John 6, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. John 6, 65. No one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. And it says, so the God of your fathers appointed you for what? Appointed you, look at this, to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the voice from his mouth. Now, you might not pick this up, but when, Jesus, when Paul saw Jesus, Ananias is, is saying, it was appointed for you to see the righteous one. They are the very words that Stephen said to the Jews when they were trying to stone him in Acts 7, 52. He said, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one whom you have now betrayed and murdered. See, Stephen saw, and Ananias saw, and Paul now sees what true righteousness really is. It's not an obedience to the law. It is a man, Christ Jesus. It is Jesus who is the righteous one. And this Stephen and Paul are linking this back to the prophecy of Isaiah. Isaiah 53 verse 11. The righteous one, that is Jesus, my servant, will make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. So what is Paul saying about his conversion and about every true conversion? Paul is saying that I used to think I was pretty good. I thought I was all right. I thought I was living okay. I didn't think I was that bad. But what changed for Paul and every person who will ever be saved 
was that they came to an encounter with Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So when that happened, Paul said, I realized I was a guilty man in the sight of God and all my good works were not assets, where they were in fact liabilities. And then you can go back to the uh, Philippians passage that we're looking in because he pretty well says this. When I came face to face with the righteous one, I saw true righteousness as it is. And then he says, whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ, Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them all rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, listen to this, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. You want heaven to be unlocked? See Christ. He is the righteous one and he gives righteousness to all by faith in him. See, we can know about Jesus. We can even believe that he is that historical figure. Uh, We could even believe that Jesus is risen and in heaven, ruling but never put our faith in Jesus, never receive his righteousness, never be transformed by him. See, some of us might think that I can just take Jesus and sort of clip him to my my belt. He is that one I need to get to heaven, you know, but I'm not that bad. Oh, sure, I look, I, I can see a few threads missing, but I'm not that bad. I've got Jesus on my side. I'm okay. He will be the guy to get me into heaven. Here's my key. Take me to heaven. Paul doesn't think like that. He looks at his life, he looks at his heart and says, I am done. I'm in tatters. I don't clip Christ to my belt. He's my life. I die, he lives. That's the only way. He's not an addition. I've mentioned this before. It's not that you take a pig and put a tuxedo on the pig and think anything changes. The pig becomes a prince. The corpse becomes alive. I die, he lives in me. There's no power in a testimony that says, I've got Jesus, I'm going to heaven. There is power in a testimony that says, I was blind, now I see. I was dead, now I'm alive. That's the power that Paul sees here. And that's why he says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, it's Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live for faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This upright, good, honourable respectable Jewish man came to affirm as Augustus top lady did as he wrote, naked come to thee for dress, helpless look to thee for grace, foul I to the fountain fly, wash me saviour or I die. And no wonder Ananias then says, what are you waiting for? Look at this, verse 16. What are you waiting for? Rise up and be baptized and wash your sins away, calling on his name. No wonder baptism is so integrally linked to coming to faith in Christ. Get up and show an outward affirmation that you are now his. That the old Paul doesn't live. The old Saul, now the Paul lives, the new one. And so he is then washed I mean, this is remarkable for a Jew to do this. And now he's washed, he's baptized. So his confession is, zealous religion actually doesn't help. And the conversion, I saw Christ and lived, and now commission. And this is linked to Paul's conversion, is the Lord's commission of his life. Meaning, Christ save Paul for himself, and Paul knows it. See, Paul continues to tell the audience, (coughs) verse 14, 
God our Father's appointed you to see his, the righteous one, for you will be a witness for him in every, uh, to everyone of what you have seen and heard. Now notice Paul doesn't say, whoa, 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 whoa. I thought I was getting in for this for free. <laughs> what's, what's the deal? Like, you own my life now? You want to tell me what to do? Yes, because you're dead, remember? You now live. He bought you. You're his. He has a right over you. And your greatest joy is to do what he says, not to live as you like. Paul said, I understand. You are not your own. You were bought with a price, 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And it's like, he's, it's like the Isaiah take two scenario, uh, Isaiah 6. Jesus says, or God says, whom shall I send? And Isaiah's got his hand up. Send me, send me. I want to go. I want to go and tell the nations about you of what you've done for me. That's a little kid. Let me do it. Let me tell. And so after three years, we find uh, in other parts of Scripture, he goes into Arabia, comes back to Jerusalem, and he thinks, I'm going to tell my brothers about Christ. They're going, to le- they're going to believe me. They know I was a persecutor of the church. And he's there, and he's wanting to tell them. And Jesus intervenes and says, don't do that. They're not going to believe you. Well, that was, it must have been astounding for Paul to, to see this. Jesus, they know me. They, they know that um, what I was like. Surely they'll listen to me. I'll tell you what, just shows the hardness of the human heart. I'm sending you now to the Gentiles. With that call, Paul was understanding that coming to Christ is not a call to live, but it's a call to die. Die to myself. And we are not called necessarily to be missionaries like Paul. But neither are we called to live selfishly for ourselves while the nations perish in darkness. Let me address believers here and then unbelievers as we finish the the text. Testimonies of true conversion are so powerful. But whether they are dramatic or whether they're not, they need to have three aspects to them. Notice he puts... An acknowledgement of my utter sinfulness before God. Renouncing personal merit before God. I've got to come to that perspective. It's a spiritual encounter. Secondly, through the word with the living Christ that results in a total dependence upon his righteousness and not my own. Did you catch that? It's an encounter with Christ through his word. I am unrighteous. He is righteous. And Thirdly, it's an acknowledgement of ownership by Christ of your life and a willingness to follow him. Paul's greatest defense of the gospel was to declare the transforming power of Jesus upon his life. His character, his thinking, everything changed. Starts with conversion and then there are encounters every day as I'm in the word of God. And I'm just being fed afresh by him changing my goals and aspirations and desires. It's a beautiful aspect of his grace. And maybe you're saying, man, I, I look at my conversion, that's like so long away. And when I give a testimony, it's like, you know, back in college, we did this. And maybe you've sort of stepped away from walking with Christ for a bit. Christ is calling us back. He is our life. Where are you at? Have you lost your first love like The church of Ephesus in Revelations 2, 4. Do you feel overwhelmed with the current situation and you're like a Martha trying to manage everything for Christ and maybe you just need to sit at Jesus' feet and listen afresh to his words and see him. Love him again, trust him again, rest on him again, cherish him again. That's what Paul's asking us to do. So remember, believer, your testimony is so special. Tell it, cherish it, love it. And but live it every day now. Let's just address unbelievers now because we see a rejection. If you take it to the next point. Luke tells us, verse 22, up to this word, up to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with this, with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. What is the word that set them off? Notice up to this word. 
It says, I will send you far away to the Gentiles, Jesus says to Paul. See, they could listen to Paul's story as long as it's at arm's distance, but when it touched the inclusive love of the Gentiles, they shut him down, they didn't like it. Truth about Jesus as Savior was rejected because they loved their self-made religion and they wanted the Gentiles out of it. They didn't want them in. Anything but them. I guess the question for us is, what is the word for you? The word for them was Gentile. I don't want Gentiles in my life. What's the word for you, unbeliever? Is it simply sin? Is it repent? Sin, man... I'm not that bad. Is it repent? Is it purity? Is it commitment? Is it just simply Jesus? What is the word for you? Paul is explaining that Jesus is the Savior and Lord who now lives. And he calls everyone outside of him to himself to be released from bondage to find freedom in him, the righteous one who will live. Similar encounter happened 25 years ago with Jesus. As Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, this remarkable miracle, you would have thought that the Jews would have said, this is remarkable. Jesus truly is the savior. But remarkably, they wanted to kill Lazarus. They wanted to kill Lazarus. Why? Because of his testimony. It is a testimony to the truth of God's grace upon his life. But the Jews, after rejecting, 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 Jesus says, or uh, in, uh, when he was speaking to them, he said, God has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart. So these ones, they had Paul right there. Paul was explaining that Jesus is alive. He's totally transformed me. He's true. They rejected, they rejected, they rejected, and God hardened their heart because they had hardened their own heart. And so I say to you, do not, do not, do not keep hardening your heart to him. Listen to the word of God. He calls you to himself. So there's the rejecter, and that could be you. Then there's the non-committed, because in, um, in John 12, there were some there that actually heard and believed of the Jewish authorities. Listen to this. Nevertheless, many, this is a, John 12, 42. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. They cared for their life. And they cared for their own glory. For it says, for they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. I bet on that day when Paul is on those steps, there are people out there in their own minds are saying, I believe, I believe. But I'm not going to commit. I'm not going to stand up. That's suicide. Now, see, when Jesus comes, you don't just attach him to your belt. You die, he lives. Jesus won't accept secret admirers. He calls everyone to come to him, acknowledge him, and live for him. There were the non committed. But then there's also the indifferent. The indifferent. Because we see that the Roman tribune was there. And he's probably listening to all of this and thinking, this is this has got nothing to do with me. This is some religious dispute. He listened to Paul's defense, and all he wanted was peace and comfort. He wanted to quell the issue. And so he said, Let's let's what is it? Um, let's examine him by flogging. Basically torture to see if what he's saying is truly real. And then Paul is just about to be flogged and he says, is it right to actually uh, flog a Roman citizen? And it says when the tribune heard this, he was deeply afraid. And he said, I got my citizenship by paying a large sum of money. See, the tribune was one of those guys who by his shrewdness and hard work had made it in life. And he didn't need Jesus. But you just see right here how his life started to crumble around him when Paul says, is it right to to whip me? So we can be vehemently opposed. We could be a secret admirer. 
or we could be simply indifferent, but we must come to him, embrace him, and receive him today. Because then Paul, sorry, Jesus gives us this word back in John 12, when all of these ones, they rejected Lazarus, they then had this belief in their heart, but they were not willing to come forward. And he gives this word, and I give this word to you, lovingly and caringly. And he said, John 12, 48, the one who rejects me, the one who is indifferent to me, the one who is a secret admirer of me and doesn't want to embrace me and endorse me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. My friend, if you are outside of Christ, the call is simple. Kneel before him. Receive him as your Lord and Savior. Realize that you can't make this life on your own. You will Bend your knee to him. Bend it now in honor of him, then bend it later and be cast into the fiery depths of hell. He waits for us. He calls us to himself. And believers, love him, embrace him, and live for him. There is no one better. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for such a great salvation that we have in the righteous one. Lord, when we came face to face with him, we understood our unrighteousness in the face of Christ and his righteousness. Lord, I pray that you would help us to not lose wonder of our conversion, whether we have been converted as a child or whether we have had a dramatic turn. Lord, both are miracles. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow in our love and dedication for you, feeding on your word and feeding on Christ daily. And Lord, for those outside of Christ, bring them into your kingdom. Let the Holy Spirit do a work on their hearts that they might humble themselves and receive him. Lord, may you receive all the honor and the glory because you are Lord. Jesus is Lord. Thank you. Amen.